Let's have a look at how to use damaged paperback book pages in our crafts and see what Marion North is up to. Hello and welcome to the treasured page. I'm Melanie and this is our quiet crafting space. I'm showing you here a book which has been damaged. It's one that's falling apart because the glue has come away and you can sometimes find these and they are a good find if you're looking for these caramel coloured aged papers that um, often are seen when they've been allowed to sit maybe near a window and they've discoloured or you know, they've got hot in the sun and the glue's come away therefore the pages are just able to fall out and um, sometimes you lose a whole section of the book just if by opening it. Well this is perfect for crafts so I'm just going to take a few of these pages and see if we can do something with those today. So I'm crafting in daylight today which is rather good. I'm at my crafting desk, it's quite cold so I've got my woolly jumper on and what I want to do is I want to use up book pages, I want to use up some papers that I, I don't really have much use for elsewhere. They are just some decorative old scrapbooking papers that have been sitting in the drawer for yonks. But what I did like is that they've got some nice botanical images in some of them. These were just paper packs for anyone in the UK. They came from works. They're not expensive at all. They're about a pound for a pack. And I thought, well, I don't know what's that. Six inches by six inches squared. So, yeah, that we're going to use those. Uh, book pages and that. It's sort of a collage. I'm in collage mode at the moment. So that's using up scraps. So we'll use up scraps. I'm wanting things that are green and pink. It's a green and pink sort of a day. Um, and that's because of the Marianne North story that's coming our way. So we're also having a look in this journal. And I have been turning to this page. Now I know that the next leg of the journey is going to take us to South Africa. And I'm feeling a bit of a South African vibe here with this wonderful inking that's on this page and just the colour tones in there. And I had thought that I would be decorating on this page but now I'm a bit loath to cover up that intricate marking which has just come about by me putting colour dye um, on a rusty pan. It's uh, different on the other side, so I prefer that side. <laughs> now they're both really cool, so I don't want to cover up either of them, but I did leave myself this folded over area, and now I'm thinking I'd like to honour the South African leg of Marianne's journey with a tip-in, um, with an extra collage that I will add in and glue to this panel so it's able to flip out and we still have that as writing space because I just like the paper. Uh, so that's what's happening. Um, I've also just been flicking through here just to get in the mood of where we're at and thinking about Marianne's journeys and how that would have affected her. She was travelling for over 10 years really without stopping this incredible woman who was just making these paintings like a machine she was just churning them out churning them out and I came upon this page and I was looking here and this is of a painting that she did in Borneo in Sarawak and this is the river that she took and she took one of these little canoe boats and with the help of people that worked where she was staying locals they took her up into the jungle to paint some of the most amazing things and to find the paintings, um, so some of these, some of these really peculiar plants that she was looking at, she found that. But she had to go in this boat in order to get there to these far-flung um, places where really had been untouched at that time. Because this was in eighteen, where was it? Eighteen eighty that she was in Borneo. So Marianne was in this little tiny boat travelling up the river and they encountered some rapids and she got tossed about in this boat and it was so fast that she honestly thought that that was the end of her. She really, really had a, 
um, a, a moment there where she thought she might not make it. And there is a new, there's a few other occasions when Marianne had some problems. When she went to Japan was one of them, where she was feeling so poorly and she'd got malnutrition, I think. She was so, so unwell. She'd got this rheumatic fever where she has uh, this arthritis in her legs. She had so much pain in her joints and not helped by being cold. Uh, she then goes and has to be looked after by um, sort of a housekeeper, only the the housekeeper doesn't feed her. So she's she's paying this woman to look after her. She's so weak and she's not being fed properly. Uh, and one of the one of the things um, that is said is that she gets into a rickshaw traveling um, pram type arrangement, a carriage, which is powered by a man running in front of her um, with this carriage on the back she sits in there and there's a collision she has this moment where she's flown forwards out of the rickshaw buggy and she falls to the floor you know straight down to the floor and she hits her head against a wall and is sort of very much um felt felt like that would that was the end of her then so she's had these life-threatening occasions where she has been really quite scared and another place where she went she absolutely adored it was when she went to java and she did some horseback riding and she was able to go riding and she really enjoyed it but they had given her an untamed horse and although she was an accomplished horsewoman and was able to ride horses she was thrown from a horse and thrown to the ground so Marianne has had some real adventures and some life-threatening experiences and these are the experiences that start to come out around this time in her life so we're looking at 1882 and um, she is about to embark on her next adventure. And so I'm just going to do that, allow you to listen to the story, which I've already just read, and I'm putting it on a voiceover so that I can just carry on here, and you can listen to that, and we'll just hear how she gets on. And this story does come with a small, a small warning. There is a bit of sadness to it. So we're just going to gently work through that as we hear the story. And then just honour the past of all the thing, all the adventures that she's had. We're just going to honour what we hear and put that down in a gentle collage. In 1882, after the opening of Marianne North's gallery at Kew Gardens, there was no question of staying quietly at home. The lure of the tropics and the promise of new plants were too strong. Marianne stood in her gallery, surrounded by her paintings. Marianne hung 627 paintings within the gallery at that time. We also know that Charles Darwin passed away in April that same year. This had an impact on Marianne North, having had the mentorship of Charles Darwin who was of her father's generation. So Marianne is stood in her gallery surrounded by her paintings. She's quietly contemplating how they all appear. She suddenly realises she's got paintings from all around the world, but not all continents are covered. She sees that there's a gap and that would never do. Charles Darwin had told her to complete everything and he had even urged her to paint in Australia and New Zealand, something that she wasn't planning on doing until he suggested it. So looking at her gallery, she probably thought, what would Charles Darwin think if he had been able to visit? And she came to the conclusion that she was missing a continent amongst her paintings. She wrote in her journal, All the continents of the world have had some sort of representation in my gallery except Africa. And I resolved to begin painting there without loss of time. So with that, the lure of the tropics and the promise of new plants was too strong. So she sets about preparing to travel to South Africa. 
By the end of 1882, Marianne was in Cape Town and for the next nine months she travelled extensively around South Africa. The wealth and brilliance of the flowers staggered her and reminded her of Western Australia. There were quantities of gladioli, heaths, salvias and lobelias, marvellous gazanias turning their eyes to the sun. Mesembryanthemums, clumps of agrapanthus and innumerable other treasures. It was the proteas, however, that impressed her the most. They take me by storm. I never had an idea of them and their variety. People brought her armfuls of flowers, so many she did not know what to paint first. Everyone was extraordinarily interested in her painting. One woman asked whether they were handwork or whether she had used a machine. Another remarked, she just takes a flower and does it all at once in colours. Then there were some tiresome girls who crowded into Marianne's room and sorely tried her patience with idiotic questions. Wasn't she afraid of spoiling her eyes? Shouldn't she save them? Save them? Save them for what? Marianne lost her temper and they all fled from the room. They thought me mad, she recorded with some satisfaction in her journal later that evening. Marianne spent some time staying with Miss Duckett, a commanding woman who ran a large farm at Groot Port. The fifty ostriches that stalked around the farm were a great source of amusement, but the abundance of fleas did not make it so desirable. At Cadlas, she at last managed to paint the biggest of all the proteas sometimes known as the King Protea. Ever since she arrived, she had been seeking a specimen in full flower and at last the prize was brought to her. She almost cried with joy. The bracts were like pink satin, tinted at the base with green and a perfect pyramid of yellow flowers rose in the centre. At Verulam she met an enthusiastic botanist who took her to see some rare aloes, which they were the sole remains of the giant forest. He told her that Q had coolly asked him to cut one down and send them a section for the museum. Marianne was fascinated by all the native people, the Zulu men and women who worked harvesting the cotton, the Pondu natives with fish and bones stuck through their ears and their hair stiffened with grease and glue, and the tribesmen dressed in their red drapery and feathers who stalked through the bush with superb dignity. However, it was at the end of May that Marianne was feeling ill and began to feel quite homesick. And what we know happened at home was that very sadly Arthur Bunnell had grown very weak and ill whilst she was away. He had suffered with cholera when he was travelling in India the year before and sadly he had been in poor health ever since. He had travelled to his brother's home and, very sadly, he had passed away in October 1882. Marianne is in South Africa in this time. She's travelling around with possibly little knowledge of this information. So in May 1883, when she starts to feel sick, homesick and ill, it could be that she is learning this news. Without the detail of her journals, I'm not able to say one way or the other, but we do know at this time she was longing for home. We also know that Marianne started to suffer with deafness. This was an infliction of her father's and an inherited 
ailment for Marianne. It was beginning to trouble her. The deafness brought on whispering sounds which tormented her. She had worked without cease and by the time she returned home she had completed over 100 paintings in South Africa. Saddened by the news of the death of Arthur Bunnell, Marianne visits her gallery with her hundred paintings and realises that an extension is needed to be built at the back of the building to provide more space. At this time, Marianne also decides that it would be nicer to have a veranda attached to the building that was designed by James Ferguson to represent a Greek temple. The Greek temple idea is then altered by the adding on of a veranda which is very akin and similar to that she would have painted under when she was in India with Arthur Bernal. It is said that the veranda was to provide shelter for custodians and that umbrellas and clogs could be kept out of wet weather. Returning home, nevertheless... Marianne, a few months later, was off again and this time she was travelling to the Seychelles. Ah, oh, here we are. So poor Marianne, she doesn't seem to have had much success with these men in her life and that was very, very sad. What a blow to hear that when you're away and there's nothing that you can do. And it was reported that she had written to him to say if ever he were ill, for him to send for her and she would come. So that must have been very, very hard to have heard that news and to have not been able to come to his aid and be there at the end. So that would have been very difficult. Um, aside from that, she did have that connection and that was wonderful and so to honour that this has been wonderful to make with the with the copying the petals there and just bringing this to life and secret journaling as well because I think secret messages did go on between them and in fact when we get to get some pictures of the Marianne North journal I think one of the things you see when you go in the sort of smacks you in the face as you walk through the door is some lettering that she's painted as you walk and you look up and it says sacred plants of Burma. That's a, such a special topic between the two um, and it is very much upfront and personal and when she comes back she then starts rearranging the gallery. She may have painted that as an additional tribute to Dr Bunnell. It would have been completely personal between the two of them. So she had and this veranda put on the building as well which is very reminiscent of something that she would have been painting under in India. So the the building was modified at a later date and she returned from South Africa. So there's definitely connections there. So Dr. Bunnell was from Gloucestershire originally in England, but he had parents that were from law and order and judges and things over in Sri Lanka or Ceylon. And so he followed suit and he was definitely, he, he was a judge. He was sent over to India to be a judge in the in the courts. Um, so it's all about justice and actually so was Marianne's grandfather was also a judge so they had that in common that connection that law and order. Marianne North was very rebellious she didn't uh, follow any kind of protocol and this looks absolutely brilliant there so I'm just going to waste no time in hinging that in there. I'm using stronger glue here to secure this flip and make sure that it works without anything pulling off in the future. So we're just going to sit it in there where I can see where it needs to go. Overhang the petals. That will be fine. They'll probably curl up and I have no problem with that at all. I just think that will look nice and aged lovely and then I just flip that over to check that that works nicely and then I can bring that back round here and I can work on it a bit easier on this way and what I'm going to do is just create a nice writing space here and then I can perhaps put some washi tape either side of that and decorate it so I think all I need to do is just gonna need to trim off a bit so I think I'll just 
take my rip ruler here. So I've just torn that down a little bit so that will now hopefully fit in there a bit better. Okay, so I've just used the stick glue there. Because it's porous paper attaching to porous paper, we should be okay with that um, sticking and staying. Well, there we go. That's the writing space with a vintage piece of paper there. Well, there we go. That goes like that. And isn't that just so lovely? I really like that. The sentiments could be put down there if, if needed, but I think that that's just really, really simple and pretty. It's complicated, but it's simple at the same time. It just mirrors what's going on in those petals. This was the very special flower that she was absolutely thrilled to find. And that was a very special memory for her because it was finally brought to her and it was a, a, one of these beautiful flowers this king protea flower that she found that was in bloom and it is a belly band so there's a tuck there all the way through so we can we can add messages papers and more journaling space there and then i've left that clear and i'll probably put some ink along there and then i've got that as a separate separate page I'm really pleased, so I hope that you've enjoyed that. Um, it is a bit sad, isn't it, on, on that side of the story? And uh, we're getting into the latter years now, so there are going to be a few, few sadnesses along the way, the road of life. But we are still having fun, and there's more adventures to be had because she is off to the Seychelles. So... Pack your sunscreen. We will be going there next time. Okay, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed that. Do please like and subscribe and leave a comment below if you thought that that was worth your time. And take care. And above everything else, just slow down and make crafting time for you. Bye bye now.